Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to classification of organisms. This is A-level biology, and uh, it's not something new to you. Already you have uh, looked at classification in senior one, and I know this one is not new. It is something closer to what you looked at in senior one. So we looked at different things, but here we want to draw our focus to this tree of life. I can see animals, kingdom animalia, kingdom plantae, fungi, uh, bacteria, and others, and then their branches, uh, uh, signifying divergent evolution into new species. We are going to expound that tree in detail as we proceed with our topic. Once again, welcome to classification of organisms. Domains. So these are larger groups above the kingdoms so domains are bigger than the kingdoms and i just want to bring your attention to the narrative of the three major domains that we have domain bacteria domain archaea and eukarya and then each one of them is branched into very many different groups as we shall see later on uh, the viruses are not living things they are in the borderline between life and non-living as we shall see uh, very soon so members i would like to ask where are we well after looking at very many divisions of living things eventually you realize human beings are mammals and we belong to class mammalia phylum codata of kingdom animalia we'll finally find out details about that later on but for now i want to draw your attention to a video uh, on youtube that talks about carolas linas the father of modern day taxonomy or classification so this fellow was a swedish botanist and uh, he was born in in 1707 and died in 1778 he participated in classification of organisms. He did a lot of studies about classifying organisms. He also played a role in contributing to the modern day binomial nomenclature that we study. And then at one time he also practiced medicine. He had a lot of love for ecology, how organisms relate with the environment. So he loved nature so much. And for that reason he published a book named Systema Natura, meaning Systems of Nature. So uh, that book is uh, currently in the Museum of Natural History in London. And uh, in this video, Dr. Charles Jarvis and Diane Taff, uh, that work in the Museum of Natural History in London, are going to explain to us the life and the works of Carolus Linus, the one who is called the father of modern day taxonomy. So uh, let's watch this video and then we shall proceed uh, immediately after the video. Remember, we are looking at uh, classification and we are trying to see the different people who did the classification. And this time around, we want to look at uh, Carola Salinas, uh, the fellow who looked at classification in detail. Carl Linnaeus was born in the southern Swedish province of Småland in 1707 and is considered to be one of the most influential scientists of his time. His life's work was to develop and refine a way to group life on Earth or to classify it. So straightforward was his system, it is still used by scientists and understood by people across the world today. His father, Nils Ingmarsson Linnaeus, was both an avid gardener and a Lutheran pastor and Carl showed a deep love of plants and a fascination with their names from a very early age. While studying medicine at both the universities of Lund and the University of Uppsala in Sweden, he devoted a large amount of his time to the study of plants, and in 1732, he mounted a botanical expedition to Lapland. Over five months, he traveled some 3,000 miles, collecting biological specimens and taking notes. In 1734, he mounted another expedition to central Sweden. He was, he was an empiricist. He didn't believe things that he hadn't seen with his own eyes. He was very reluctant to take um, on, on trust something that somebody had, had written about. In 1735, Linnaeus moved to the Netherlands.
Netherlands, and it was in that same year that he published his most well-known work, the Systema Naturea, or the System of Nature. In it, he outlined a new system for the naming of all living things. There are, I guess, two, there are two main things that, that Carl Linnaeus tends to be known for. Um, the one is, uh, as far as his classification systems, um, which at the time were, were, were really rather revolutionary, particularly in the plant kingdom, rather less so amongst the animals. Um, and the second thing is uh, his introduction of, of, his, uh, of a, a new naming system using a, a genus name, a species name, um, the so-called binomial system. Um, now of the two, um, the, it's the, the latter, it's the naming system that um, is, is his primary legacy. Uh, this item is the first edition of Systema Natura, the one where Linnaeus actually outlines his sexual system for classifying plants by you know, the number of stamens and the arrangement of the reproductive organs. So this is the first time it's appeared in print and so that's why it's important. You can see it's very large and I tend to explain it as being the 18th century version of an Excel spreadsheet because you can see it's very table-like. By the time the 10th edition appeared in 1758, this had shrunk from this really large size to a much more sort of portable thing. But it had gone from only 11 pages to two fat volumes. Returning to Sweden in 1738, he practiced medicine specializing in the treatment of syphilis and lectured in Stockholm before being awarded a professorship at Uppsala University in 1741. Throughout his life, Linnaeus showed an interest in nature and the systems which govern it. He wrote not just about classification, but also about ecology, how organisms interact with their environment. He explored food chains and even defined the concept of race, dividing humans into four groups, Americanus, Asiaticus, Africanus, and Europeanus. Forced to retire from teaching in 1774 by a stroke, Linnaeus suffered a further stroke and actually died in 1778. Linnaeus was driven by a lust for all nature and the desire to understand and classify it. His legacy remains and is used by the many dedicated scientists today who are driven by that same desire. Well, Carola Linnaeus there, tribute to the father of classification. So what is classification? This is defined as the grouping of organisms together based on the features that they have in common. Well, we shall, as we may see later on, different groups of organisms. The grouping of these organisms uh, it was dependent on uh, the common characteristics or the common features. And uh, taxonomy is the science of classification. It's a branch of biology that deals with classification of organisms. Uh, we want to look at the branches of taxonomy. There is one branch called nomenclature, from the uh, Latin word nom, nom, meaning name. It's the giving of names to organisms. And then systematics, which is the placing of organisms into groups, basing on their similarities and differences. Uh, we are going to see later on that many organisms or all organisms are at least belonging to a given group. And what makes them belong to that group is the similarities that they possess together. So at least now we know how to define what classification is, the grouping of organisms together based on the features that they have in common. And then we have seen their taxonomy, which is the science of classification, and then the branches of taxonomy, nomenclature and systematics. One of the things that uh, Carolus Linus looked at or proposed was binomial nomenclature. Coming from the two words, bi meaning two, and then nomia or nom meaning name. It is the science of giving two names to organisms. And we use the language called Latin. Latin language is greatly used in science. So it is the act of giving two Latin names each organism as a way of identifying them. And this language of naming organisms is used all over the world to minimize confusion among the scientists who speak different languages. So those of Carolus Linus 
and others proposed that Latin could be used to equalize the communication of different scientific aspects all over the world. So what is important in this binomial nomenclature is that the first name is the generic name and the second name is the specific name. The generic name is the name of the genus and then the specific name is the name of the species. So in binomial nomenclature, we assign each organism two names, the name of its genus and the name of its species. And then those two are joined together to form a scientific name for that organism. Now, there are rules that we follow. One of them is that the generic name starts with the uppercase or the capital letter, while the species name starts with the, a small letter. So that's a simple uh, aspect there, that when you're writing scientific names, the name of the genus starts with a capital letter. And then the name of the species starts with a small letter. And then, unless if you are uh, you are typing, if you are typing, you, you italicize, you use italics, that icon in the in your task, in your computer, uh, called it italics or it, to italicize. You see that there is bold, capital B, then U underline, then I italics. So you italicize. When you are writing your scientific names using a computer, please, you have to italicize them so that whoever is reading your document, your research, will know that this must be a scientific name as long as it is italicized. And then if you are writing it, handwriting, in case you do not have the computer, you underline those words separately. For example, human beings belong, have, belong to genus Homo. And then the species is sapiens. Our genus is Homo, and then our species is sapiens. So our scientific name for human beings is Homo sapiens. So if you are typing it, you italicize. Like you have seen there, they have italicized. But if you are handwriting, you underline these words separately. Homo and then sapiens. That's beautiful. Yeah, so in summary, binomial nomenclature uh, talks about assigning two names to organisms as a way of identifying them, and that name becomes a scientific name. In the plants, those names may be called botanical names, in case they are names for plants. Well, we have between 5 to 100 million species of organisms on Earth. Indeed, it will be very difficult to name them. But the scientists developed this binomial nomenclature to assign each one of them a scientific name. Well, we have a number of them there. For example, antelope. The scientific name is Antelope Savicapra. What about the wolf? The wolf is Canis lupus. What about elephant? Elephas Maximus. Well, there are so many. So many. What about tiger? Panthera tigris. That is the, botanic, the, the scientific name for tiger. Well, you can see here, for example, the dog is Canis lupus. But also the wolf is Canis lupus. The dog and the wolf belong to the same species. As a matter of fact, the dog and the wolf can reproduce. The dog can mate with the wolf and produce fertile offspring. But the difference is that the dog is domesticated and the wolf is still wild. So that's why the word familiaris comes from for the dog. Otherwise, they all have the same scientific name, Canis lupus. So familiaris was a prestige name given to the dog for the fact that it's domesticated. Okay. What about the horse? Ecus sabalus. So that is the, the, the horse. The cheetah, the house mouse, the great horned owl, the pigeon, the sea snake, and many other animals have names. Then for plants, we have a number of them there you can look through. Um, which one do you want to remember very fast? Tomato. 
Leucopascum escolentum, that is a scientific name for tomato. Now, because it is a plant, we can call it botanical name. From the word botany, the study of plants. So we can say Leucopascum escolentum is a botanical name for tomato. Uh, what about the guava? Sidium guava, that is the botanical name for guava. Sidium guava. Uh, what else would you want to know? Well, there are so many others. You can research about them and then you can master some of them. That would be good for you. Great. Welcome back from that binomial nomenclature and then the examples there. Uh, in taxonomy, we also look at uh, the taxonomic hierarchy. We know the word hierarchy means levels. Yeah, usually from the highest to the lowest or from the lowest to the highest. That is the hierarchy. So also in the taxonomy, in classification, we have hierarchy. And in descending order, organisms are assigned in two taxonomic groups called the taxa. One is called taxon and many taxa. And this taxa in the descending order include the following. Beginning from the biggest to the smallest. The biggest is kingdom. Remember we had a domain. At our level, we don't so much on the domain. But we want to start on the kingdom. Kingdom is the biggest. And then we have phylum. In the plants, we sometimes call it division. Instead of calling it phylum, we call it division for the case of plants. And then under phylum, we have class. And then under class, we have order. Under order, we have family. Under family, we have genus. And then under genus, we have species. So how many are they? My dear students, there are seven different taxa. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. In senior one, we used to cram this by using uh, some, some cramming words. For example, this same hierarchy would be crammed as King Pharaoh could order for good soup. King Pharaoh could order for good soup. Where king stands for kingdom. Pharaoh, phylum. Cold stands for class. Order remains order. Mm -hmm. And then good means genus and then species soup. So we have king Pharaoh could order for good soup. Well, but at A level, I wouldn't expect you to, now that you already know them. In senior one, we are just introducing them. But now you already know them. So there are seven different taxa. The biggest is kingdom and the smallest is species. Now each, each taxon, each one has a diagonistic feature. Something peculiar with it. Something which is unique that makes it belong to that different taxon. For example, when you look at the, 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 the phylum codata, that phylum of animals called codata, they have a vertebral column. And that one makes it unique and it makes it belong to all those members in phylum codata have vertebral column. So the vertebral column is a peculiar feature. It is a unique feature for codets or for those members who belong to codata. And then still in codata, when you go to class mammalia under phylum codata, you realize that all mammals have fur on their bodies. They have hairs on their bodies. So the possession of hairs or fur is a peculiar feature of the mammals. It is some unique feature for those organisms called mammals. It means all of them possess that feature. Okay. So at least by now we know that there are seven different taxonomic groups. And each one of them has a peculiar feature. And has members that belong there. Somebody might ask you now, what is a species? So members, this is a group of organisms having many common physical, behavioral, physiological features that are similar. So they have similarities in, 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 in physical, in their common features, in their behavior, 
in their physiological processes and most importantly they are also able to reproduce sexually and when they reproduce their offspring are also fertile so for you to belong in the same species it means that you have similarities that is the baseline you will have a lot of similarities in your behavior features in your body processes there are similarities but also when you you should be able to reproduce if you belong to the same species and that is why a wolf and a dog can reproduce meaning they are in the same species and their offspring is also fertile a chinese and a ugandan can intermarry and produce a child who can also produce another child an american and somebody from zimbabwe can get married and and produce a young one and that young one can also produce in future so meaning chinese americans ugandans zimbabweans are all of the same species so that is evidence that they are of the same what species because they can reproduce we have seen a lot of black americans yeah because of that intermarriage so at least we now know what species is we now know what species is what about an elephant and a cow can they reproduce mm, well no they cannot reproduce meaning an elephant and a cow are not in the same species so they cannot reproduce so at least now we know what a species is a group of organisms that are similar and can reproduce fertile offspring so we can see some of them there you can see which species can you identify well there is the toads there the beetles those are members of the same species they are even mating then the human species the most advanced species of all organisms the human species there that beautiful family that sarongo and narongo well that's great so members i would like you to also know that there are some ways we use for classifying organisms and there are majorly two there is one called artificial classification and then there is a natural classification artificial classification this one is based on a few easily observable characteristics for simplicity and convenience so any one of us can do that one you just get organisms look at them sort them out based on their differences and similarities what you'll be doing will be artificial classification for example the aspect of dichotomous keys all of you can classify organisms using dichotomous keys what you'll be doing is what we call artificial classifications because you are simply based on a few characteristics you are able to see and then we have another one called a natural classification this one considers a lot including natural relationships between organisms internal and even external features the features include considered may include embryology the way the study of embryos how the embryos develop physiology functions of body parts and organs biochemistry different molecules and chemicals that make living tissues cell structure how the cell is structured the different organelles then behavior so there is a lot to consider in a natural classification but of course it's more comprehensive but also more conclusive so there are two major ways of classifying organisms artificial classification which bases on a few characteristics that are observable and then we have natural classification well thank you very much we also have some other terms we use in classification we have what we call phylogen genetic classification and this one is based on a evolutionary history phylogeny is the study of evolutionary history of organisms so phylogenetic classification is based on evolutionary history organisms belong to the same group are believed to share a common ancestor for example all primates are believed to have, to have come from the common ancestor human beings chimpanzees gorillas monkeys are all believed to have come from the same background or same ancestry so that study of phylogeny 
is uh, what we call phylogenetic classification. And of course, this kind of study is uh, more enhanced by the use of uh, paleontology, the study of fossil records. Yeah, you've, up to now, people are still uh, doing a lot of uh, fossilization, study of fossils, paleontology. Then we have phonetic classification. This is based on only one observable characteristics. It's based on only observable characteristics. And uh, all characters are considered to be important. A lot of data is collected and related between organisms is usually calculated by the computers. Uh, so phonetic classification is based on uh, observable characteristics. It is the, a study of classification that focuses only on observable characteristics. So some things that are not observable to the scientists will, will be ignored in this kind of study. It is more of artificial uh, form of classification. Uh, great. So, but what is more accurate? The most accurate methods of classification that give us uh, good conclusions are uh, natural classification. Remember, natural classification that considers both internal and external characteristics. It also considers behavior, uh, it considers uh, embryology, physiology, and so on. Then we have also phylogenetic classification, uh, study of organisms, study of evolutionary history of organisms. So these two are the most accurate. However, you also need to know about the others. Uh, great. So having known about uh, different classification ways, uh, we also want to look at uh, specimen identification and keys. And uh, I know you must have heard about, or you must have ever constructed dichotomous keys. So they belong here. They are keys that are used to identify organisms. So specimen key involves listing observable characteristics of organisms and matching them with those features which are diagonistic. In a particular group. Look at uh, the features of an organism, for example, the grasshopper. Look at them, and then does it have any feature that will qualify it to belong to class insecta? Well, then you look through and find out. So you observe the characteristics and uh, match them with uh, the features of different uh, taxa, taxa, either class or kingdom. Well, I know you can all do that. You have done this several times. The characteristics used in keys should be readily observable uh, morphological characters. They may be qualitative, e.g. shape, or quantitative, e.g. number of segments. So the characteristics you use must be easy to see, must be easy to manipulate, and they can be qualitative, those that you can't count. For example, shape. Yeah, and then they can also be quantitative, those that you can easily count. For example, segments, number of legs, number of antenna, number of eyes, and so on. So you base on such characteristics, qualitative and quantitative. But most important, they should be easy to observe and manipulate. So uh, this you have done several times, and uh, I know you have done what we call dichotomous keys. So to take you about a summary about dichotomous keys, uh, basically this is a simple diagonistic key in which pairs of statements called leads, each dealing with a, part, uh, a particular characteristic, are numbered one, two, three, and so on, depending on the number of organisms you are using. So you have leads. For example, you have one, and then in that lead there are contrasting features. Yeah, you use contrasting statements, but about the same thing. And as we shall see shortly, the paired statements of each lead should be contrasting and mutually ex exclusive, such that by considering them in order, a large group of organisms are broken down into progressively smaller groups until a known organism is identified. For example, just an example here, uh, for arthropods, we have the first key there. You can say in the first key, in the first lead, 
we are talking about legs and that's what we are talking about. You have identified that these organisms can be differentiated based on legs. And then what is the difference? You have those that have eight legs and you have those that have six legs. So you have already grouped these organisms into two groups based on legs. And then you come to second one. You are looking at antennae. There are those that have long antennae. There are those that have short antennae. Then, then the third key, you have in the third lead, you have proboscis and mand or mouth parts where we have proboscis and mandibles. So in simple terms, taking you through this uh, dichotomous key, uh, you look at the organisms that you have. In this case, there are about four organisms. And then you look at the four and see what can I use for differentiating these organisms into two groups. Then you learn that there are there are legs, two groups based on legs. There are those with eight legs and there are those with six legs. So then you divide them. But those with eight legs, it's only one organism, W. And then those with six legs, there are still many. So you, you say you push them to two. In the second key, you are talking about those organisms that have six legs. And of all those that have six legs, what can you use for differentiating them again? Then you learn that they have an antenna. The antennae are not the same. Uh -huh. Then you divide them based on the antenna. You learn that there are those with the long antennae. And it's only one. You write the, that uh, organism there. For example, X. And then there are those with the short antennae. You realize there are many. So you push them to the third key. So in the third key, you are discussing organisms that have short antennae. So what can you use for differentiating them? You can look at the mouth parts. There are those that have the proboscis. And there are those that have the mandibles. And then you would have made your dichotomous key. I will not dwell much on this because I know you have already practiced. You have already done this several times. I know all level and uh, you are capable of still doing it. So I want to encourage you to practice more dichotomous keys. You can do dichotomous keys for plants. You can do for leaves. You can do for different organisms and you'll be able to appreciate the biology there. You can do this at home and uh, you collect uh, all organisms, organisms that you can get and then try to construct dichotomous keys. So thank you very much. This is our lesson one. Uh, we shall have lesson two very shortly. Please stay at home and stay safe.